guys, this is Editing Georgia here. I'm sorry this video was so late, but I just had so much footage and it was just a pain to edit and it just took so long. And I really wanted to get it up this week because I didn't have anything last week, so I didn't want to save it for next week. So you're getting it this week, just a couple days later. I will leave a timestamp in the description to when I actually start reviewing it because I talk about a bit of things beforehand. Enjoy! Hello everyone! I'm Georgia and this is The Sound of Georgia. I was initially going to do a video last week. It was going to be yet another Today in Julie Andrews History video. But then Hamilton came out and then it was my birthday and then I realised it was Despicable Me, which I've seen maybe five times at the absolute, absolute max. I haven't seen it in years, and Julie's character's barely in it. But if you're wondering, this big will me turn 10 last week. Yes. Don't we all feel old? But let's get back to topic. Today is my review of Hamilton the movie. Oh my goodness, I love this movie so much. I've watched it five times since it came out 11 days ago, 12 if you want to count the third. So just under two weeks. I've watched it five times in just under two weeks, which may seem kind of low, but I'm actually okay with that. Watching something I love over and over and over again was the exact mistake I made with Sound of Music. And I'm not going to let that happen with Hamilton. So on days when I don't have an overwhelming urge to watch it, I'm not going to. Now, just before I get into the actual review itself, I just wanted to give my thoughts on a couple of things that have been making the news recently regarding this movie. First of all, the Cancel Hamilton thing. If you don't know, there are people who want to see the musical off Disney Plus and I think off Broadway altogether once it gets back because most of the characters in the show were slave owners and or traders. And given what's going on with the Black Lives Matter movement, they think it might be a little inappropriate right now. Now, I'm a white woman and I am on a completely separate continent, so I am not qualified in any way to talk about this. So all I am going to say is that I do not think it glorifies these people's lives at all. And the second thing I want to and the second thing I want to talk about it is going back a bit in the archives of news regarding this film, and that is the fact that it was advertised as the original Broadway cast. There was a bit of an uproar when the news came out because one cast member, Betsy Struxness, was not going to be in the movie. And I'm almost positive you know exactly which one she is, even if that was the first time you've heard her name. She's the blonde one. That was all I had to say, wasn't it? You know exactly which one she is. The entire company of the show, in fact every company that ever does this show, looks completely unique, but you could argue that as a blonde in a sea of brunettes, that Betsy stands out a bit more. And yet, I've watched the Tony performance of Yorktown so, so many times, and it was only on the last viewing that I realised she wasn't there. Unlike the Tonys, I went into the movie knowing that she wasn't going to be in it, so there was definitely an I know she's not there thought in the back of my mind. And I'd be lying if I said that my eyes didn't stray to the actress that took her place a little bit more than the other members of the ensemble, because it definitely did. I'm not going to write this off as she's an ensemble member and that's not as big a deal as the principals. Not by any means. The ensemble is just as big a part of the show as the principals, but I feel like the issue's a bit more complex than Betsy not being there automatically means it's not the original cast, just like that. The fact that the film was marketed as being the original cast is the biggest problem regarding this. And I'm pretty sure Lynn amended his statement after this popped up, saying that it was the original principles. Betsy had left the show six months after it came to Broadway, so it wasn't a case of the show was being filmed the week she had to take a break. No, she'd been gone for a while. So if you want to really nitpick, no. The show is not the original cast, in that every single member who started at the very beginning is not there. If somebody's left the show a significant amount of time before it's filmed, I think it's just something we have to live with. And once again, 
I'm going to reiterate, I am not downplaying Betsy's role in the show. I know she gets a special shout out in The Revolution because of her dance skills. And I know just from watching the clips in Hamilton's America and the ones you can find here and there, that she is awesome. She is awesome and we're not going to forget her. But I just know this got a bit newsworthy and I wanted to share my thoughts on it. I don't know if Emmy Rover Lampman was also in the movie. I didn't see her. Hey everybody, it's Georgia from the past. It's five o'clock now, so I'm just about to start watching the show. And I am really nervous, actually. I'm, I'm really, really excited, but I'm really nervous. Anyway, as I said in my video last week, I want to try and give you some in real time reactions I have to watching this. This is not going to contain any clips of the show, obviously, but I will tell you my reactions. So my plan is to check up with you at the end of Act 1 and then check up at the end. But I will also check in with you any time along the way where I have a very strong emotional reaction. There will be tears. Now, back to Georgia from the present. Now that all that's out of the way, I'm going to talk about the things I loved. Well, some of the things I loved, because I love so, so much about this movie. Are we counting it as a Disney movie? Because if we are, it's absolutely my favourite Disney movie. So here are just some of my favourite moments. They're all really little moments here and there because I don't want this video to be as long as Alexander's Constitutional Convention speech. I don't have a moment for every song, and I've got some songs that have two, but they're just because those are tiny little moments that stood out a bit more to me than some others. The first one I've got listed is with Aaron Burr, so, and it's where Burr asks Alexander if he punched the bursar, and Lynn goes, considering we're talking about punching people, I just think it was really funny that it went, like that. Then towards the beginning of Story of Tonight, there's a moment where they're all drinking, but Alex is standing kind of off to the side from the other three. And I thought that was a really nice touch. He's the new kid in town, he still feels a little awkward. I just thought that was really cool the way they did that. But by the time we get to Far and Refuted, he's all cocky again. And I just love the way that song has them moving all around as they try to talk over the top of each other. Also, this moment. Obviously, after Farmer Refuted, we have You'll Be Back. So, I'm going to talk about King George, but I'm going to talk about all his moments in one hit. I'm not going to talk about how he was drooling, because everyone and their mother has talked about how he was drooling. I love the way he did the everybody. He sounded so bored, which was completely different from what you get on the album. And, and of course, in What Comes Next, where he stamps his foot and the spotlight turns blue and the way he just ends that song shrugging. But possibly my favourite King George moment is definitely in I Know Him. Jesus Christ, this will be fun. And moving on to Helpless. And moving on to Helpless and Alex's little dance after his proposal monologue. I really love how the hug he gives Peggy is much more platonic than the ones he gives to Eliza and Angelica. And then when he does his little dance and his father-in-law comes over, he's clearly thinking, oh, what have I done? So moving on to the wedding and satisfied. Yes, we all know, Drunk Lawrence is hilarious. But I'll talk more about Lawrence in a bit. The choreography in Satisfied is insane. You always hear that. If there's one song that usually gets praised for its choreography more than any of the others, it's satisfied. And it's well deserved. The way they rewind is just crazy. And I think my favourite part of that is at the very end. For those who haven't seen it, the rewind is staggered. But when you get to the very end, Lawrence does a twirl within a twirl as he moves around to take Angelica's glass. And I think that's really cool. You can actually see that on the little clip of Satisfied they released before the show came out. I'll leave a link in the down below. I also love how right before she makes the toast, Renee takes this little breath like she's mentally preparing herself for what she's about to do. So the next little favourite moment I can think of is from Story of Tonight Reprise. And this one is a favourite moment just because it's really kind of wholesome. 
especially compared to what I hear on the album. And that's when Bird tells Alexander that she's married to a British officer. And Alex goes, oh. In the film he's very empathetic, I think. Whereas on the album I always got a very pissed off and judgy vibe. But watching it he seems to be really sad for Burr. So stay alive! He's wearing the glasses! That was really interesting because I didn't think that would happen until Act 2. I didn't think he'd start wearing the glasses until he was a little bit older. So Act 2. But the fact that he's wearing them in Stay Alive I just thought was really cool. So the next one I'm going to talk about is probably the biggest surprise of the show for me and that is Ten Door Commandments. Oh my god. This scene just completely blew me away. The way it was filmed and edited it was just awesome. By the end every word was showing a different character and it was just awesome. So what happens after Ted Bill Commandments? Oh, meet me inside. Now this might be a bit of an unpopular opinion but I really like the last line in this. The call me son one more time. I really do love the way Lynn delivers that line. As soon as he's finished speaking he knows he's messed up. Big time. So he backs away and he's looking ashamed almost instantly because he knows that he might have messed things up forever. Moving on to Guns and Ships I absolutely love the way they delivered the letter with Lafayette passing it to one person and then on and on up the top of the mezzanine or surround or whatever it's called all the way down until Alexander gets it again. I don't know why but I also really love the look he gives Eliza before he leaves. To me it reads very I'm coming back. Okay now after the war. Dear Theodosia is wonderful. They're starting the song standing up and then he's sitting down by the time Alexander comes on and then when they start to do it they're both sitting down. It's I don't know why I really like that. I've heard a bit of talk saying Lynn is the weakest link in terms of the acting and while I can see it to a degree I think he's awesome and I really do think he's an extra level of awesome here. When he sings this bit he just has a big aura of awe. Of pride. No that's not the word I'm looking for. Yeah yeah yeah. I bet he was thinking about Sebastian. Also talk about a stealthy entrance. Where did he come from? I think a huge part of it is the fact that it's filmed but he just pops up like his entrance is almost invisible. Suddenly he's there. A lot more surreptitious than any other entry or exit. I've got a few for non-stop but that's just because it's well non-stop. As I understand it the song covers six years so there's probably going to be a bit more. In the beginning where he's talking about this is the first murder trial he looks a bit like he's in the eye of the hurricane so foreshadowing I guess. But I think my favourite moments in non-stop is when he goes to talk to Burr. I love how there's a lamp on the side of the stage when Burr walks out. It really does look like he's just opened the door. I think it would have been really cool if we could have had him pulling on his coat like he's getting presentable to open the door but that's not a movie thing or even a show thing. It's just a little thing I thought could be cool. And then there's the way Alexander explains his plans about the Federalist Papers to Burr. On the album at the point where he goes the new US Constitution. I always got the impression that he was a little bit embarrassed. I don't know why but I did. Here the way Lynn plays it it's very oh my god this is the best idea ever. Right? Right? <laughs> and at the very end this could be seen as a bit of a bad thing I guess. The way he smiles when he says let's go. That felt a bit more like a Lynn and Chris moment more than a Alexander and Washington moment. It did still feel like an Alexander and Washington moment but there definitely seemed to be a bit of Lynn and Chris there as well. And if that's the case does it seem lazy or a break in character or something like that? Me? I personally don't think so. So I mentioned him a little bit earlier and seeing as towards the end of Act 1 we lose him it's time to talk about Lawrence. Specifically because he has a moment that doesn't make the album. I thought Anthony played him perfectly. 
absolutely perfect. In my video, in the video I did way back when I talked about shipping real people and lambs, I said that there were three main reasons why it was a thing. One, slash ships, so gay ships, are huge. Two, it might have been a thing in real life. And three, Anthony Ramos is gorgeous. And after watching this, I understand why it's a thing so, so much more. And I think the best part is that the way he plays the role, it doesn't actually matter what you think about him and Alexander. Whether you choose to believe this is proof of something actually romantic going on between them, or just a deep, deep platonic relationship, it works. I think Anthony's portrayal was spot on. So now, spoilers for the musical and history. So if you've only listened to the album, I'm about to spoil you. If you've read The Revolution or just know a bit more, then you already know this, but for anybody who hasn't done anything more than listen to the album, spoilers coming up. Did I know we'd actually get to see a scene about Lawrence's death? Yes. You can find the older version of the scene, because Lynn calls it a scene. You can find the older version of it pretty easily. It has a different letter in it, but the song part is exactly the same. So I've heard that old version a lot, but I didn't realise until I was watching the movie that Alexander doesn't know it's bad news. I always thought that as soon as Eliza told him the note wasn't from Lawrence, that he would know something was wrong, or at least fishy, and that the reason he asked her to read it to him was because he didn't think he'd be able to read it without breaking down. Nope! Nope, he doesn't know that Lawrence has died. For whatever reason I thought he'd... Also, you can briefly, and I do say briefly, see Lafayette and Hercules Mulligan up the top of the stage, because they get the letter too. We really don't get to see any of their reactions through the movie, and that is something I am really looking forward to seeing when I go see it at the theatre. It's intermission checkup time. Wow. 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 I don't really have anything else to say. It's just amazing. Amazing. I will have watched it several times more by the time this video comes out, so I'm sure I can get more in-depth thoughts for the rest of it later on, but now just wow. Are we up to act two already? Damn, what did I miss? Heh. Oh my god, David is just having so much fun in this song. Especially at the beginning when he's blowing kisses and waving and just playing it up so much. It's very amusing. And then when he arrives back and Alexander introduces himself, he looks over at Madison like, this guy? That's the guy? Then in Cabinet Battle 1 we've got Alexander's bit about whatever the hell it is you do in Monticello. If you look at the clip in Hamilton's America, he just sort of dances around on the spot in a circle when he says this line. It's much bigger in here. He's doing a full-on imitation thing. Reminded me a lot of Elphaba in What Is This Feeling? With the way she imitates Glinda. Sorry, gut Glinda. The little dance he does when he says that line really reminded me of that. Continuing on funny, Philip's exit after he does his rap in Take a Break. Oh my god, it's brilliant. The way he puts his hands up and runs off stage, it's like he's just finished giving a concert rather than a musical. It's like, thank you Richard Rogers Theatre, good night! Skipping over the affair to Room Where It Happens, I actually really like the way Lynn plays the very first part of this song. He seems very distracted when Burr starts talking to him as though he's still processing what he's just done with Payne James. So I love the dance move in this song where they're all lined up together and they cross their legs and spin around in unison. I don't know why, I just do. Also I saw this gif of this one particular moment in the song. And every time I look at it, I laugh my head off. Back to Jefferson being extra in Washington on your side, Burr's the first person to sing during that song, and when he does that, David's just looking around like, wait, what? Who? <laughs> and also Madison's over-enthusiasm when he pops up to say that he wrote the Bill of Rights. As for the Adams administration, well, the best bit about that song was cut. 
the best bit is the rap that had to be cut. But the fact that King George is on stage for this scene makes up for it, I think. The rap really didn't need to be there, as cool as it is. So we get King George instead. We have more Jefferson being overdramatic in We Know. And I'm not talking about the bit where he goes, what? I'm talking about when he says, my god. On the album, I always thought he sounded genuinely surprised. But maybe he's actually not. Here he really does just look like he's saying something because he knows Alex is waiting for an answer. He says it in a very, is this how you wanted us to respond way. I find, a lot of the time I find with musicals, I don't seem to enjoy act two quite as much as I enjoy the first act. And in a way, it's kind of true this time around. I mean, I've told you a billion times before, I can't rank the songs because I love them all as much as each other. But the content of Act 2 definitely doesn't excite me as much. Alexander's turned into a dick, but we all know that. But what can I say about Act 2 so far? Jefferson is hilarious. I wasn't really a big fan of Jefferson when I first listened to the songs. I'm recording now because I'm pretty sure my next update will have me in tears. And I haven't cried yet. One last time got me close, but no tears yet. I thought it was a good idea to give you an update before that happens. Also, I noticed with um, Cabinet Battle number two that some of the lines that Washington says were a little different. Instead of provide aid and troops, it was commit, and it was the only one you have to convince rather than person you have to convince, which is what it is on the album. Back to Georgia of the present. I don't know exactly what moment I really like in Hurricane, but I did actually tear up a bit last time I watched it, so there must be something. I wouldn't have thought Hurricane would be one that made me tear up, but it did. So Angelica turns up at Reynolds' pamphlet to berate Alex, but the biggest bit for me in that song is four words. Philip gets a copy. The way he looks up at his dad is just heartbreaking. Continuing with Philip and heartbreak, I really liked the touch they had at the end of Stay Alive Reprise. After Eliza screams, Alex reaches out to take her hand and she doesn't pull away immediately. It takes her a moment to fully register what's happening and only after that happens as she pull away. It's quiet uptown. Here come the waterworks. So now instead of pulling her hand away, she's taking his hand. And that's when he finally breaks down. But what I love the most about that moment is she comforts him after he breaks down. Right at that moment before they walk off stage together, she's definitely comforting him in a way that he's not. Probably moving on to the next song. Can we get back to politics? When first campaigning and the like you could grab a beer with him, line comes up, he kneels down and he goes, yes! And I love that. I guess the next one I want to talk about is kind of the scene in its entirety, but then it's only a minute long, and that is best of wives and best of women. I think this moment is really underrated. It's not just that it's their final moment together. We see that Eliza has fully accepted her husband in every way. She's asking him pretty much the same thing she asks him in Take a Break. But in Take a Break, she's not leaving the room without him. She's basically dragging him out. This time, when he says no, she just lets it go. But she's not giving up. She's understanding. She finally understands and accepts that just because Alexander won't come back to bed with her, that doesn't mean he doesn't love her. Then we have the duel, and we get to number five, and we realise that we're in the same spot Philip died. And so Philip's standing on the side of the stage and as soon as Alexander rushes over in that direction, he disappears. And then when Alex does his monologue, it's Washington that tells him to look up. And then going back to Philip, the way Anthony stands at the top there as Lawrence and then twirls around and becomes Philip, 
just uh, god playing those roles must be hard it's not simply that you die you have to die twice and then finally we have one of my favorite songs yes i know i said multiple times i can't rank these ones but i can probably give you a top three and this is definitely in the top three and my favorite moment in who lives who dies who tells your story is actually solely an actor one probably and that's when Washington steps out and Eliza says that she speaks out against slavery. And then Washington, who's standing right behind her, looks ashamed and backs away. If you watch Hamilton's America, you'll see that the fact that Washington was a slave owner was the one aspect of his character that Chris will never be able to reconcile. He'll never be able to make peace with that. So the fact that he was able to put that little reaction into his performance, I think, is wonderful. Don't worry, we're not done yet, we've still got more. Now I want to talk about the specifics of it being a movie, particularly with camera angles. I talked in my last video about how I was planning to go watch all the other little clips you can find and see how they were edited as opposed to what was in the movie and to see how they were similar and how they were different. And particularly with the opening number, I found this really interesting. So in addition to the movie, you also have the opening number that they did at the Grammys. And you also have a clip of the opening number, or the last little bit of it anyway, in Hamilton's America. And they were all filmed slightly differently, so it was really cool to see that comparison. But then there are some moments that I couldn't even tell they were different from the other clips. Also, does anybody think the last chorus of my shot is choreographed and staged like a workout video. And then there's That Would Be Enough. What sort of magical angle did they film this song on? And it looks like it could be out of a movie movie rather than just simply something that was filmed on stage. I mentioned in the last video about how everything seemed very blue and I speculated that maybe when they filmed all the clips earlier for the documentary and all that that they might have left the house lights on. Nope! The trailers just seem to showcase a lot of the moments in the show where the lighting is blue. That was not the whole show. Now, moving on, I want to talk a bit about the not-so-secret secret role of the bullet. For those who don't know, she's an ensemble member and she gets killed pretty early on and for the rest of the show, she's basically a harbinger of death. Maybe it's a little different at the theatre, but the movie makes sure you see her death. Even if you don't notice her for the rest of the movie, you very clearly see that. Like with Lawrence and Tomorrow There'll Be More of Us, I knew about this going in. But it was still really cool to see because it wasn't what I expected. I knew we got to see her die, but I thought it would be a lot more subtle, a lot more hidden. I thought it would happen after the next song had already started and it would be a blink and you'll miss it moment or something's happening on the side of the stage but I'm not really sure what it is. But nope, she gets her own little transitional scene. So if you didn't know about her or notice it beforehand, watch her. The next time you watch the movie or go and see it at the theatre, watch her. Watch what she does and who she interacts with. And finally, the last thing I want to talk about is the bleeping. I understand why they had to bleep it. They had to bleep it because Disney and more than one F-bomb gets an automatic R rating. And when I say R, I mean R in US terms. I think for us down in Australia, that's the equivalent of MA. When I look at Disney+, Plus, it's rated M, which is the Australian equivalent of PG-13. And I think they did the bleeping perfectly in Yorktown. I don't know if there's even an actual bleep. It's just sort of silent the way it was at the Tonys. Washington on your side, on the other hand, he is a little more distracting. Lynn said it was kind of a record scratching noise, though to me it almost sounds more like a warp noise. It's not as annoying to me as it was the first couple of times I watched it, but I still think it would be better if they went for a straight traditional bleep, like they do in Out of its Administration. And that's everything for today, guys. I really could go on so, so much more. There could be a whole section on things that I thought were different just from listening to them. But hey, I have to save some things for future videos. 
So maybe I'll make a separate video about that. There were so so many other things I loved and I'm sure this video is going to be incredibly long as it is. But nevertheless I hope you enjoyed. I think I'm okay. Hopefully I'm not crying so much anymore. That was beautiful. I loved it. I have a new favourite Disney movie. So many things that I got and so many things I know I've missed. It was the best birthday present I could have asked for. Thank you, Lynn, for everything. Let me know what did you think of the movie? How awesome is it? And what were your favourite moments? Feel free to like and subscribe and I'll see you in my video next week. So long for more!